so in spoken word poetry events, we, when we really like a line, we snap our fingers. So can we all snap our fingers now? Awesome. So now when you guys hear a line from this poem that you think you really like or that it just really hits you, you know what to do. <laughs> Stop eating your words away. My mother always tells me, see, I have a tendency to speak so fast people very sometimes would say, so I find myself speaking so slowly. Just to make sure that everyone in the room can hear exactly what I'm saying. You probably can see that I have a pace problem, which is why I can't pace a conversation. I can't tolerate the eye contact, the hurricanes of questions the world is waiting for me to say something smart or witty or funny, and all I can offer is, um, I don't know, let me think about this. A blank paper lets me think about this. It doesn't glare at me when I jot the wrong words down. It listens. It understands. It doesn't tell me what to say. It is just blank, empty, patient, asking me to bring it into life, reminding me to turn the thunderstorms in my mind into a gentle breeze. It absorbs each word and lets it take the space it needs. So I drag it right, then speak, because with a paper, I know that I can start with, um, I don't know, let me think about this, and I can arrive to its ending with, hey, I thought about it, and I might know a little, which is a little different than blanking into someone's face and trying to shackle my thoughts from blowing up in every direction. People, they are too busy to be considered with days, too short to fit the time that my voice requires to start making sense with minds, too full of their own opinions. Usually, I just want to disappear, but I'll only walk away slowly, and I will pen down the only truth that I know, that blank papers are my best friends, my saviors, my home, and when I see it, when I see a pair of slightly trembling lips or a head buried down in the corner of a room trying its best to be invisible, my lips will curl themselves into a smile, and when their voice prevails, when their shaky, nervous, uncertain voice mumbles its way into a room, my head will tilt itself to their direction, my eyes will fill up with patience, my heart will speed up just for theirs, and I will do what blank papers have taught me. I will listen. Thank you. <laughs> so, thanks. So, Clichés are the boring and repetitive sentences, stories, and ideas that we've all heard or heard a version of before. We see them as unoriginal, even mind-numbing. At uh, best, at best, a story, uh, a cliche is normal, but normally we see them as mediocre. And the main problem with cliches is that they are overused. We have heard them so many times; they just simply stop being special. They're an everyday thing now. Now, with all of that in mind. I want you guys to think about one thing about yourself that you would consider a cliche, something about you that you think is totally boring. It can be an interest, a habit, or just a stereotype that you really fit in. And I want you to think about, to keep that one thing in mind, because throughout my talk, I will prove to you why that cliche is actually awesome. So one way that I'm a cliche is that I'm the youngest child in the family, which means that up until this point, my mom still calls me by all of my other siblings' names before remembering my real one, <laughs> and I don't even bother correcting her. <laughs> it also means that growing up, I was surrounded by people who could understand concepts and ideas that were way out of my mind's reach. So I always try to read. I felt like books were these magic portals that led me to a world where everyone else's minds made sense. And when I was 10 years old, my dad came home carrying a huge blue book. It was probably the biggest book I've ever seen. And I, the book said, Al Salah Jaheen, the full works of Salah Jaheen. So I asked my dad, who is that and why did he write so much? And he told me he's a poet, he writes poetry. And I didn't really know what poetry meant, but I started reading the book and I couldn't understand what most of the poems were trying to tell me, but you know, I kept reading them anyway. <laughs> and every single day I'd go to my older sister who I thought knew everything in the world and I'd be like, can you please explain these to me? And she would. And by time I started to comprehend the poems all on my own and the book became my best friend. I carried it everywhere, I read it all the time and I memorized it cover to cover. Well, except for the really long poems, I tried my best with these. <laughs> and I remember thinking my, to myself, whoa, Salah Jaheen is a magician, like he has this superpower with words, he can actually use them to explain his own fears and thoughts and ideas and emotions. I was the shy kid that stuttered whenever someone looked at me. I could never be a poet. 
or so I thought until I started seeing this on the news. A revolution sparked in Egypt. And I remember on the 29th of January 2011, I was standing at the balcony of my house and there was a protesting march passing by and I could see the people religiously chanting their demands for their rights and I thought to myself, whoa, <laughs> this is history. I'm witnessing history, right? At this moment, I have to tell the story. And that was why I wrote my first poem. And when I went back to school, I was just showing it to a friend of mine when a teacher happened to overhear me. And on the same day, the same teacher passed by my classroom and asked me to go with her, which is strange. This doesn't usually happen, and it usually means bad news. So I was thinking, <laughs> what did I do? What, what did I do? What could I have possibly done wrong? So I asked her, where are we going? And then she said, we're going to the principal's office. <laughs> I was panicking. The principal was an old, strict, extremely, like, you know, strict lady that, she, she, she just always seemed to be mad at something, and I was really scared just to be around her. But that day she asked me to read her my poem in her office, and I did, as scared as I was, and, she had, and then, like, it was my first time ever seeing her smile in my life. It was, you know, incredibly confusing, because up until that point, I just thought she didn't smile. It didn't seem like her thing. <laughs> <laughs> and then she asked me to read my poem in front of the whole school, and I said yes, and I went back home and I started practicing for my big performance, and then when the day came, I was kind of confused that this amount of people were listening to me as I spoke, and then they clapped after I was done. Because being the youngest child cliche that I am, I had to be really, really, really loud in order to be heard in my house. <laughs> but in that moment, I felt very heard and seen in a way that I didn't even know existed. But soon enough, I started losing interest in poetry, and I just wanted to be cool. I wanted to be, you know, to have more friends, which means that you can't be different, quirky, or weird. Which is, let's, let's face it, that's exactly what poetry is. And I felt blank soon. I just, you know, everyone here probably knows how it's like to be an 11 years old and so confused and to have all these big questions about life and not even know how to put them into words. And that was my problem. And then when I was 12, I had to move from Egypt to Kuwait, a place that I've never been to, and that only added to my confusion. But then at 14, I got a bit lucky. I stumbled upon a TED talk by Sarah Kay where she spoke about her, about her journey with spoken word poetry. And she described that as poetry that refuses to just sit on paper, that something about it demands to be heard out loud or witnessed in person. And I really fell in love with her story because when she had her first performance, she was a 14 years old and she was shy and awkward and she didn't like it when someone looked at her for too long. And well, Obviously, neither did I. We both fit into the cliche of being scared and young and overwhelmed by all of these people around us, and that got me to connect with everything that she said, even the parts that I couldn't have possibly experienced so far. And it reminded me that because she used to be the cliche, the, the cliche of someone who was young and afraid and there was more to her than that, then there is probably more to me than what I was then. And it's, it inspired me to write, but I was really scared of something. I was really scared of writing a cliched poem. How many people here have been told to avoid cliches at some point in their lives? Can I see it all? Yeah, well, me too. It almost seems like avoid cliches is a cliche. <laughs> <laughs> but it's there for a reason. It's there to remind us that we have to be authentic. We have to be original and creative with our work. And it actually brings the best of us. So in that way, avoid cliches is a cliche that is there for a purpose. The same way that time, the once upon a time is a cliche. But how else are we going to start our bedtime stories? And time heals all wounds is such a cliche. But I know that I have very little in common with someone who lived 500 years ago, somewhere completely different, spoke a whole other different, different language, but both of us, at some point in our lives, needed to hear that, that time de does hear all wounds. Right now, I'm the cliche of someone who just, like, you know, doesn't speak. <laughs> so cliches do this super cheesy thing where they just, they jump over all barriers that could separate us and they connect us as humans. So this talk is very for humans. If you are a robot, this is your cue to leave. And I'm really hoping that no one gets up right now. <laughs>
And as I dived into poetry, I realized that poets do use cliches to connect with their audience a lot of the time. And one of my favorite examples of that is the poem Accents by Denise Fromm, and where she described her mother's thick accent and uh, thick Spanish accent while speaking English. And the way that she chose to describe that is English sits in her mouth remixed. Keep in mind, she said remix, not this figure, not sits in her mouth uncomfortably, it is remix. That one sentence changed the way that I thought about my own accent, because at the time I was surrounded by all of these non-Egyptians, and I only needed to speak one sentence in Arabic. And everyone would know exactly where I came from, and that made me feel extremely self-conscious. But the pride that Denise Fromman had when she spoke about her mother's accent, how she described it as a stubborn compass, always pointing her towards home, it reminded me that my own accent is exactly that, too. And, um, yeah. And because she showed me how to defy the cliche of someone who, was, who didn't culturally fit into their surroundings and was so afraid of that, the poem gave me freedom. And about a month ago, I was preparing uh, a poem for the AUK International Week uh, about Egypt where I come from. <laughs> and the poem was full of cliches about living in Egypt. It's about how we put everything in Cuneva, even red velvet. <laughs> it's about how the traffic is constantly paralyzing, but somehow McDonald's arrives like super fast. <laughs> It's about how where I come from, there are too many things lacking, too many dried up plants, too many plastic bags flying where they don't belong, too many cars parked where they shouldn't be, too many struggles, too deep rooted into the system to avoid too much noise, too much hassle, too much of us, too much of everything in a population that knows how to get by despite all the chaos. And I, <laughs> I showed this poem to a friend of mine who is not an Egyptian, actually she's not Arab at all, she doesn't know anything about Egypt, and after I was done with the poem, she gave me the best compliment that I ever received in my life. She said, Angie, you made me feel like an Egyptian. You made me want to cheer to this poem the same way that an Egyptian person would. And I was speechless, but I knew that this is the power of cliches. When we show our own mundane, extremely boring details, we get to connect. I believe that poetry is somewhere between extreme anxiety and mind-numbing comfort. It's a state of wonder. It's being able to look at the familiar things and really be amazed by them. And when we, we are always afraid of sharing stories that we think are boring. They are just too lame. They are not surprising enough. And well, that's true. But that is how we get to connect. Your boring story, probably the person next to you has probably lived through a similar version of that story. And that is where you guys get to be friends. You are always one honest cliche from making an amazing friend, from making someone else feel less lonely or cry or you know, laugh or sympathize with you. And I get to see the magic of a cliche turning a room full of strangers into friends who can laugh and cry and sympathize with me. So I'd like to end this talk with a poem that I was afraid to write, <laughs> one that I didn't want to share with anyone uh, for about a month after I wrote it, because I just thought they would think it's too lame. A poem full of boring details and cliches. Here are cliches that make me who I am. <laughs> one, I really love my hair. Two, I'm really clumsy when it comes to anything at all. So, if you, so in one of my really messy days, if you try to hand me a cup of coffee, I will probably put it down because I would rather not drink the coffee at all. I would rather not have the cup at all or even feel its warmth than risk the chance of breaking it free. I'm not good with words. All I am is just a messy head that can only explain the chaos that's going on in here using hurricanes and thunderstorms. Four, I am terrified of people. Five, I am constantly terrified of whatever's going to happen next. Six, I'm scared. Six, I'm scared. Six, I'm scared. Six, I cannot just keep saying that I'm scared. I cannot just keep repeating synonyms of the word terrified. I cannot just keep saying phrases that would tell you how terrified I am, and I know I'm a poet. I'm supposed to be able to come up with a metaphor that would tell you how terrified I am instead of repeating the word over and over and over and over again. But I learned, to be honest, I learned to say things exactly the way that they are and exactly the way that I am, as <laughs> terrified of everything, even right now. I'm terrified of speaking my poetry out loud in front of people who may or may not like it, but I'll speak it out anyway. Because above everything, above all, I'm terrified of letting this, this fear consume me, so I'll consume every bit of energy that I have left in me trying to kill it. So seven, 
I feel in colors. So when I tell you that I'm feeling gray, it probably just means that I really need a hug. When I tell you that something you said made me feel pink, it means that you put a smile so huge on my face that no normal description could serve a justice. When I tell you that I'm breathing red, it means that I'm being patronized by my passion again. It means that I'm telling you, that I'm asking you, that I'm begging you to help me, and I know. I sound completely ridiculous when I speak in colors, but it is the only language that I'm truly fluent in. Eight. Times a thousand is the number of times that my niece forced me to watch Frozen with her. Nine. <laughs> I secretly enjoyed it every single time. Ten. I'm really clumsy when it comes to anything at all, so if you try to hand me your heart, I will probably push it away because I would rather not have your love at all. I would rather not have your trust at all or even feel its warmth than risk the chance of breaking it. Eleven. I'm really bad at lying, especially when I'm not okay. 12, I'm really good at staying up past my bedtime. 13, I'm still learning how to love myself. 14, I still have a long way to go. I have worlds that I'm yet to discover. I have a future that I'm so terrified of, but I can't wait to dive in. I still have me. I still have me. I'm not done yet. This poem will forever be unfinished because you know what? I can never, ever, ever fit myself in any number of points, but let me tell you this, 15. I'm really clumsy when it comes to anything at all. I stumble upon my own words and I trip on my own thoughts. Sometimes I feel like I'm broken beyond being fixed and other times I feel like I am fixed in place, but I'll keep moving anyway. I still will take every step, even when my legs feel like they weigh tons. I will take every step. I will keep moving. I will keep trying. I am trying. Thank you.